Hi again. This is the third of our programs on chemical bonding, and today I want to take a look at drawing covalent structures. We're going to use a method that was developed by Gilbert Lewis that usually use, involves a series of dashes or dots to represent the position of the electrons and how those are shared amongst the atoms. First off, I'll start with an example by looking at how to draw carbon tetrachloride. The first thing I need to do is determine the total number of valence electrons that I have available. To do this, I'll consult the periodic table. Carbon, from its location in the periodic table, has four electrons and chlorine seven. Since there are four chlorines, 28 in total, that then gives me 32 total electrons in my diagram. Again, we're just looking at the valence electrons. I now draw what's called the skeletal structure. To do that, I place the atoms there's fewest of in the middle, and then the other atoms around the periphery. I begin by placing the electrons at the bonding sites, and I do that by placing them in pairs. So I place one pair at each site between the atoms. Those are called the bonding electrons. Now I take the remaining electrons and complete the octets of the atoms that are on the periphery or on the outside, but I can't exceed the 32 electron total. At this point, after placing all of the electrons, I've reached a total of 32. If I had any left over, I would give those to the central atom, but in this case, I've already used up the full complement of electrons. The next thing I'm going to do is to check the octets of all of the atoms. Now, all of the octets with the exception of hydrogen, because hydrogen's just happy with two. So looking at the chlorines, they all have eight. The central carbon has eight. So this is a complete Lewis diagram or Lewis structure for this molecule. You can replace the shared pairs of electrons with dashes, and this diagram is also acceptable. Let's look at a few more examples. Let's try carbon dioxide. Again, by consulting the periodic table, I determine the total number of valence electrons, 16 in this case. For the skeletal structure, I'll put carbon in the middle and the oxygens on either side. The first place the electrons go is between the atoms. Then I complete the octets of the atoms on the outside. There's no atoms remaining, so I can now move to the next step by checking their octets. Here I notice that the two oxygens are satisfied, but the carbon in the middle is not. It's short four electrons. To solve this, I'm going to move some of the electron pairs around. In the first case, I'll grab two from this oxygen and move them in. It improves the situation, giving carbon now six, and I'll do the same with the other oxygen. Now it has eight. So both, all of the atoms have a complete complement of eight electrons. This is sometimes drawn this way. Let's try carbon monoxide. Four electrons from the carbon, six electrons from the oxygen, 10 total. Carbon in the middle, oxygen on the outside. Place electrons at the bonding site. Complete the octets of the atoms on the outside. At this point, I have two electrons left over, so I'll give them to the carbon. A quick inspection of their stability indicates that the carbon is short electrons. So I'll move one pair in. It improves carbon situation, but it's still short, so I'll move another pair in. So as a result, I actually end up with a triple bond between the carbon and the oxygen in carbon monoxide. We can also draw ions using this technique. Here I have the carbonate ion. You may recall this from ionic compounds. The bonding within the carbonate itself is covalent in nature, but the bond between carbonate and, say, a metal is ionic in nature. Anyway, total up my electrons. The presence of the two minus indicates there's two extra electrons that I have to add to my total, and you can see that here in the equation. As a result, I have 24 electrons to place. My skeletal structure puts carbon in the middle and the three oxygens on the outside. I go to the bonding sites first, and now I complete the octets of the oxygens. At this point, I have no further electrons to add to the picture, so I'll now check their stability. Again, the carbon in the middle here is short a pair of electrons. To solve that situation, we'll move in a pair. One of the things you need to remember when you're drawing ions is to incorporate the use of square brackets and to place the charge. It's incomplete if you don't have that present. So whenever you have an ion present, be sure to incorporate the square brackets. 
And let's look at a final example. This is called ethene. Two carbons and four hydrogens. I total up the electrons in much the same manner, with 12 electrons total, or six pairs. For the skeletal structure, I'll put two carbons in the middle and four equally spaced around the, on the periphery. I place electrons at the bonding sites. And now I complete the octets of the atoms on the outside. In this case, hydrogen is full. But I still have two electrons left, so I'll give them to a carbon. Quick inspection indicates that one of the carbons is satisfied and the other one is not. To remedy that situation, we'll create a double bond in there. And that gives the following abbreviated structure. You'll notice in this particular molecule, there's no unbonded pairs of electrons that we have seen in some of the other molecules. There are a few that break the rule, and in particular, very, very small atoms that are unable to hold eight electrons. Boron is an example in the periodic table with only uh, six, um, four protons, five protons. If we take a look at boron tetrachloride, we have a total of 24 electrons. We begin with the skeletal structure, putting boron in the middle and the three chlorines on the periphery. Fill up the bonding sites and fill up the periphery. There's no electrons left. We now proceed to check their stability, and we see that boron has six in the middle. But boron, being a small atom, can't hold more, so we, there is no need to create a multiple bond. And we're finished at this point. Another atom, beryllium, even smaller than boron, can only hold four electrons maximum. So when we take a look at its structure, beryllium dichloride, we have 16, electron pair, 16 electrons, or eight pairs. Beryllium in the middle, chlorine on either side. Bonding sites fill up the periphery and now we'll check the octets. In this case, we're finished. Beryllium can't hold any more electrons. There's no need for multiple bonds. Covalent bonding also leads to a condition called resonance. Resonance occurs when there's more than one possible Lewis structure for a molecule. I'm gonna return back to carbonate. Here I have the structure of carbonate that we studied earlier. At this point, it's incomplete because the carbon in the middle is unstable. We remedied that situation by moving in a pair of electrons to create this structure. But that's not the only way I could have solved the problem. It also would have been possible to move a pair of electrons from the top oxygen down, and that would create this structure. And in a similar fashion, I could have taken the electrons from the left oxygen and moved them in to create this structure. In fact, carbonate does all three. They call this phenomenon a resonance. Now, the actual structure of carbonate is a hybrid or mixture of these three structures interchanging between each other. Sometimes it's represented by this diagram, where we know there is always a single bond present, but there could be a double bond at any of those locations. Benzene is one of the classic examples of a resonance structure, C6H6. It consists of six carbons arranged in a ring surrounded by six hydrogens. And here is an appropriate Lewis dot structure for that molecule. However, those double bonds can move to different locations, as shown in this diagram. So benzene has the ability to exist in either form. Finally, covalent bonds also have what are called a coordinate covalent bond. In this situation, one atom can do all of the bonding. Let's go back to carbon monoxide for a moment with 10 electrons. We have carbon and oxygen in the skeleton structure. We place the electrons at the bonding site, complete the octets of the peripheral atoms, and then place our extra electrons at the carbon. Now here I'm using dots and X's to represent to whom the electrons belong. So for instance, the dots will represent carbon's electrons and the X's will represent oxygen's electrons. Electrons are truly interchangeable and identical to each other, but I'm just showing ownership here. So to solve carbon's dilemma, who's a bit short, we move a pair of electrons over to create bonding electrons between the carbon and the oxygen. And then we have to move another pair in. At this point, we notice that one of the bonds, one of the three bonds, the oxygen is doing all of the donating of electrons, that bottom pair. And we can represent that with an arrow. This bond, or this special bond, is called a coordinate covalent bond. We also can see it in the ammonium molecule. 
ammonium shown here, NH4+. Nitrogen has five electrons. The hydrogens bring four electrons. However, one of them is lost in electrons to give it a positive one charge. We'll start with the skeleton structure to place our eight electrons. And here we see them. Now, again, you'll notice in the picture that three of the hydrogens share electrons, but the one at the top, the nitrogen is doing all of the bonding or providing both of the electrons. That's our coordinate covalent bond. A coordinate covalent bond is identical in strength and behavior to a covalent bond. You need to practice drawing these structures to become quite quick at doing them. I hope this helps and please, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Some of your teachers may show you a method called the formal method. A formal method is another technique of drawing these structures.